Welcome. My name is Peter Berg. 30 years ago in October of 1991, 10 centers across the country opened their doors, turned on their lights, and started answering questions. These centers, located at universities as well as for profit and nonprofit organizations, were known collectively as the Disability Business Technical Assistance Centers, or DIBTACs. They were funded by the US Department of Education. Over the course of time, the name was lengthened to include DBTAC Accessible Technology Centers. Currently, the centers are funded by the US Department of Health and Human Services, Administration on Community Living, National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. The centers individually are known as ADA centers and collectively known as the ADA National Network. While the names and the federal funding have changed over the years, the mission and dedication of, the, of these centers has not changed. The centers are funded to foster voluntary compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act by providing guidance, training, and information. I am fortunate that we have with us current and former directors of the ADA National Network Centers, and we're gonna hear about the history, present day, and a look into the future of the ADA National Network. Erica Jones is the project director for the Pacific ADA Center. Erica is one of the directors that has been around since the centers began operation. Erica, could you talk to us about the early training that you participated in in preparing to open the ADA Center and talk about the early questions and trainings that you and your staff provided following the passage of the ADA. I'm gonna start with the second part of your question first uh, that will lead me in to the background of the training that I and other colleagues received as we launched this huge ADA program to the public. <clears throat> One of the tenets that we had to learn and be trained on is that there were 10 centers and one coordinating center for 11 of us that were designated as providing uh, technical assistance information, training, dissemination material to the world. We only did one thing, which was the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, but we provided this information to the world. So we got all kinds of questions initially of what is the ADA? Can you explain it to me in a paragraph. Um, can you come out and train our staff on the ADA in 30 minutes? Uh, can you send us all the information you have on the ADA? All these questions today seem absurd and ridiculous, but it was due to the lack of conceptual framework and knowledge of what the ADA really was. So we did the best we could, having been trained about the actual ADA regulations and content. All right, Jim DeYoung is the recently retired director of the Great Plains ADA Center located at the University of Missouri. Uh, Jim was back there uh, in the beginning, back in October of 1991, when the ADA centers opened up their doors. Uh, Jim, can you talk to us uh, and tell us what it was like to uh, open up an ADA center? What, uh, what, did, that, what did that entail? Well, Peter, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on. And uh, uh, when we first started, um, I'd obviously been very involved in, you know, uh, developing the ADA as well as, as steering it through Congress. And um, then we saw that the ADA centers were included in the passage of the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, and we we're very excited. And so uh, 
with the announcement that the centers would be funded, uh, the various uh, entities across the United States and the 10 different um, regions as defined by the Department of Education at that time, uh, put out notice for centers. We were fortunate enough to be able to be awarded that center in serving Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri, and join with our colleagues from across the United States, the other nine centers. Um, the beginning, Peter, was very tough, to be honest. Um, we were having to find location, which uh, even at the University of Missouri, it was finding space within there. It was hiring staff, as well as getting technical assistance then from the covered entities. Uh, when we first turned our phones on, and there was an 800 number linked for all the centers to use that's currently still used with the 1-800-9494-ADA, we were getting technical assistance questions with no supporting documents from any of the federal agencies to use as a background. Fortunately enough, we had been to a training at the beginning or opening of the centers that, was, that we heard from folks from the Department of Justice, from the EEOC, from the United States Access Board. Um, those are the ones I remember. There may have been others. Uh, oh, and obviously Department of Education. But we had no documents like we have today or technical assistance manuals that we utilize today. And so we're really flying by, uh, you know, uh, the best we could to, to answer many times some very complex questions, even beyond what we had learned in the training. Obviously, if somebody asked us about a dimension of a doorway, it was easy to answer. If somebody was asking a more detailed question, it was a little bit more difficult. So as, as we grew um, and our relationship with the federal agencies was nurtured, as well as uh, established first, I guess, and then nurtured, we started to learn more, um, not just myself, but my staff as well, and the staffs across the United States to be able to provide very adequate technical assistance to entities. John Wodach is the former chief of the Disability Rights Section with the U.S. Department of Justice. John, the ADA National Network is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Talk about the relationship that you and the Department of Justice has had with the network over the years. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm delighted to talk about the ADA National Network. When we started the ADA back in, uh, well, it was enacted in 1990, um, despite the fact that there was a lot of attention to it, people didn't know what it meant. People didn't understand it, what the requirements were, people didn't know what their rights were, businesses didn't know what they were supposed to do. Now, the Department of Justice obviously had an obligation, but a lot of people, businesses, weren't going to come to justice to ask questions. And so the establishment of the ADA National Network was essential to having people understand what the ADA means. And the Department of Justice and the network worked together from the beginning so that there was a free flow of information so that we could ensure that accurate, up-to-date information was being given. And I think that 30 years has shown the success of this effort. The ADA National Network has been essential in people understanding their rights, in businesses understanding what their obligations are. Now, some people say to me, well, isn't it, you know, isn't that over, they understand what it is now. And, and I think what we've learned over time is that this is dynamic, the issues change. In the past couple of years, what, what does COVID mean? What are some of the issues? What are some of the requirements for the ADA for telehealth? What do you do about face masks for people with disabilities? The need for information and changing information is constant. And I think the ADA, Nash, ADA National Network works very well with the Department of Justice, with the other federal agencies to ensure that they are giving um, appropriate information that they're reaching entities that the government wouldn't by themselves do. It has been a delight. And I can't imagine the successes of the ADA without the involvement of the ADA and National Network, the 10 centers, the superb people that have worked um, on these issues over the years in doing webinars, trainings, conferences, and just answering people's questions on the phone. It's been a delight. 
and I wish the ADA National Network another 30 years because we're going to need everything you've got for the next next years dealing with everything from accessible websites to whatever the future is going to hold for people with disabilities in this country. Karen Goss is a former director of the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Talk about the benefit of having a national structure of 10 regional ADA centers across the country. I think the importance of the 10 regional centers comes down to being able to understand the needs of your local community, of the states that you serve. With the regional opportunity came opportunity and continues to uh, provide opportunity for the ADA centers to be able to know how to refer to local resources. So when we get calls that come in that are questioning the ADA and we're providing that information for that voluntary compliance that Erica mentioned earlier, we can then refer them to local resources where they can get additional information, they can partner, collaborate. The other thing that we are able to do is to really tailor trainings and information and sometimes even write fact sheets that are youthful for a local area. Because the thing about us as, a, as the United States is, it varies the proximity to resources, the geographics, the population, things of that nature across the country. So although our message is consistent, the application uh, may be influenced by your local need. Oshi Harrison is the director of the New England ADA Center. In what communities has dissemination of information been difficult? And what have the centers done to conduct outreach to these underserved communities? Thanks, Peter. I'd like to talk about the work we've done to reach out to an underserved population, people with addiction and in recovery. The reason why this work was very challenging in the first place was because people with addiction and in recovery are unaware of their civil rights under the ADA. So they were very surprised to hear that they had protections under the ADA. But through discussions with individuals with addiction, family members of people with addiction, and addiction counselors, we learned about unique problems facing people with addiction, like access to employment, access to the criminal justice system and issues there, access to health care, and access to recovery homes. So we decided to show how the ADA addresses addiction through our trainings and through the development of fact sheets. And we need to do more because it's estimated that 22 million people are in recovery in the United States. So we need to reach out to people with addiction everywhere and then focus on people who are in the BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, and people of color with addiction. And this is a very exciting and expansive moment for the ADA National Network to do this. Vin Nguyen is the director of the Southwest ADA Center. Vin, Talk about how some of the significant ADA Supreme Court decisions impacted the work of the ADA National Network. Uh, and that's a difficult question, Peter. Um, I want to note that uh, in terms of significant city ADA, I believe uh, Olmstead uh, versus LC um, is by far the most uh, significant case uh pertaining to the ada since it confirmed that people have the right to live in the community uh, when it is appropriate rather than receive their services and in institutions in terms of um the most uh the case that really impacted our work though uh, was sutton versus united airlines uh, which involved uh, two airline pilots who applied uh, for United Airlines and were not, um, they were not accepted because of uh, the airline's vision requirements. Uh, because of that case, um, and for a good about 10 year period, 
like almost the entire focus of ADA litigation that um, was pending on whether a person was disabled enough or not. Uh, and uh, the University of Alabama versus Garrett case, which um, talked about how states uh, have sovereign immunity against ADA plaintiffs in federal court. Um, the news reported that as being that Title II of the ADA was uh, unconstitutional. So there was a lot of confusion uh, after that from the public that uh, thought that uh, state governments did not have to comply with Title II uh, because of that case. And uh, luckily there was another case, uh, Tennessee versus Lane, which confirmed that that was not true. Um, state governments always have to comply with the ADA. Um, it's just uh, depends on what kind of remedies uh, you can get uh, when you sue them. Um, that's what the issue is, not whether they have to comply with the ADA or not. Wendy Straubel-Gower is the director of the Northeast ADA Center. Wendy, how did the questions and training needs following the passage of the ADA Amendments Act change for your region and the ADA National Network? Well, Peter, just as Vin just mentioned in regards to training, the ADA Amendment Act was really a turning point for our services in TA. All of a sudden, the issue of do I have a disability uh, became a lot easier to explain and explore with people who called us because of that congressional guidance that said disability should really be interpreted broadly. Um, before our focus was so much on um, disability that we forgot to think about the discrimination that the ADA was supposed to, supposed to prevent. Um, uh, Congress also brought up those three cases highlighting the issue of uh, whether or not something is a disability um, and really focused what matters is the discrimination, which made our job just so much easier. Uh, with employers, I think we uh, encourage employers to stop focusing on disability so much and instead to think about um, whether or not their policies and practices were discriminatory and the actions that they had taken. Um, employers have always been interested in reasonable accommodations, so that you know was still something that we did a great deal of the time. Um, the other change that we really noted when we thought about this um, was the, the um, there was an increased awareness and an interest in filing charges with enforcement agencies. So people saying to us, can I have the information to, to contact the EEOC or the DOJ? Um, because they felt like it finally mattered. Sharon Rennert is a senior attorney advisor with the ADA GINA division within the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC. Talk about your relationship with the ADA National Network over the years. Well, Peter, I go back to the very beginning when the National Network was created. So um, hard to believe 30 years have gone by. Um, but uh, from my perch at EEOC, uh, at the beginning uh, was involved in helping train uh, the folks in the network uh, because we looked at it as helping EEOC very much. A partnership was formed 30 years ago. The EEOC did not have the resources on its own to reach all the people that the national network was intended to reach. Um, we also realized that there would always be people more comfortable reaching out to the national network than to EEOC. Uh, a lot of employers weren't necessarily comfortable reaching out to a, an enforcement agency uh, to get help. So hence for us, it was really about a partnership that we were really pleased to join with the network to do initial training, to do updated training over the years, to be available as a backup to help consult uh, as you all got questions. And you all helped EEOC in developing all the publications that we have uh, published over the years by letting us know what you were hearing on the ground. Again, you would be closer to uh, things than we would be. 
And so as you all contacted us to say, here's what we're hearing from folks, here's the issues that are they're struggling with, coming up with, that would be incorporated into the publications we wrote, what publications we were choosing to develop, the questions we wanted to address. So it was very much a two-way uh, partnership. Um, we got from you, we gave to you, um, and from my perspective, it has been a real help to the people the ADA was meant to help, frankly, uh, that we've all been able to advance the cause of civil rights for persons with disabilities. And in the employment realm, really help employers understand why there's an ADA, um, how the ADA is meant to be approached here, uh, the value of diversity when it comes to individuals with disabilities. So I'm glad to have been a partner with you. Uh, hope to continue the partnership at least for a while longer. Uh, but congratulations on reaching 30 years. Robin Jones is the director of the Great Lakes ADA Center. Robin, talk about technology and how it has changed how you and your staff work and provide information and answer questions. Well, I'm sure some of my colleagues can remember um, the ways that we did business uh, when I first started, because I'm one of the original directors um, as well. We didn't even have computers, or if we had computers, they were strictly for word processing, nothing else. The internet itself was uh, very much in its infancy, and we really didn't have our, we didn't have our first website um, until 1995, um, which, you know, was several years after um, the, we opened up. We had intranet, but not internet at that time. Um, we also um, used to uh, use uh, what we called acetates and uh, create our own uh, overhead um, uh, for a presentation. So we didn't have PowerPoint as we know it today or any of those programs and things. We used to create them onto uh, acetates and use an overhead projector um, to, uh, pre to present um, our presentation. So we didn't have the slickness that you see nowadays with things um, rotating in or fading and, and moving around and, uh, you know, all kinds of diagrams and stuff of that nature. We also did the primarily a lot of our um, technical assistance and our dissemination through fax. Um, through good old snail mail, um, and uh, we didn't have the ability to email a document to somebody or send them to a to a website um, per se, or when we wanted to do blasting out about trainings and things of that nature, we had to mail out flyers um, or you know or use telephone tree or something of of that nature. So you know the, when you think back of how I, I used to carry a um, huge projector with me everywhere I went um, that connected to my computer uh, in in order to uh, present my first uh, cell phone, which I did not have, even though I traveled extensively, I didn't have my first cell phone until um, 1994. And at that time, the cell phone was as big as my suitcase. Um, and uh, it was called a bag phone. And you had to have a special antenna you put on top of your car in order to get any uh, reception at all. So just even communication and staying in touch and such, we had a beeper system. So I carried a beeper around in order to be reached by my staff or be, you know, that they needed to uh, get a hold of me or somebody was trying to reach me or whatever. So lots of changes. Uh, you know, the one thing that's not changed is our telephone line. Um, you know, that, that we've always had the 800 line as a national network and that has remained a very key component to the, but we've also expanded to other methods of communicating with our community and public using those technology advances and such. So all of us, in, you know, including our office, have forms on our website where somebody can submit something through that process. They can submit um, questions through the national network um, email um, and, and or um, website. So there's a lot more ways for people to contact us. Um, social media, what was that? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, even now it's taken me a lot to become, you know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, you know, uh, uh, TikTok, uh, Instagram, uh, you know, LinkedIn, et cetera, all of the social media platforms and such that, you know, um, those of us that are older or been around for a long time are maybe not as embraced the same way that other others do, but we found it to be an extremely effective way um, to use technology to communicate to a really broad, vast um, majority of individuals and also be able to look at 
and target that are certain ethnic groups that use certain social media more than other and, and such of that nature. So to also um, increase our outreach in, in that regard. Uh, you know, using text as another way for people, video phone as another wet method for people. Um, you know, the TTY, you know, um, is pretty much silent these days, but it's, you know, other ways that, it's not that we don't hear from the, the deaf, hard of hearing community, but we just hear other ways because they use other technologies. As I think COVID also really um, uh, shined a, a technology light um, and demonstrated how effective people could be, um, not always having to work in the office, but to transition to their homes to work and still be as effective. Um, and then use the technologies of uh, virtual meeting and things to replace the face-to-face -face trainings that we used to do that we no longer could do because of COVID. Um, using various webinar platforms, meeting platforms, and things of that nature have really transformed. Um, and we think that's going to uh, a trend that's going to stay. That there will be more and more people that will be um, still looking to do virtual um, training versus the in-person training because they found that they can involve more people. It's more convenient for their staff. It's less expensive, um, and such. And so that's really been a, a boon in a way uh, for us to increase uh, um, our services and stuff. And then just the uh, proliferation of different learning platforms and ways to create training that is self-paced. Um, you know, um, instructional learning for people that they don't have to be in a course at a certain time on a certain date, um, that they can get, engage in that information on their own time and, and still um, get the information, get the credits they need for, you know, their AIA or for their human resources or for whatever um, license and such they have. So technology, I think, has been a real boon. Also, it's um, made sure that people with disabilities had more equal access to what we do and serve. Um, you know, it used to be that we had reams and reams of Braille in our office, um, but now with, you know, accessible media, um, less people um, are asking for the hard copy Braille uh, format as long as they can get an accessible copy um, of a document electronically um, to be able to access. And, and when we look at virtual platforms and, and being able to incorporate accessibility of, uh, you know, sign language and, and real-time captioning and things of that nature into those, it really um, increases the access that people have that have not previously had a lot of access as long as, again, they have internet, which is still a barrier um, for, for some people. And we do have to remember that and, you know, be aware and uh, familiar with how we serve a broad range of people. But the technology has definitely made it um, easier for people more efficient for people, um, and uh, more at their fingertips than ever before. Andrea Hanley-Mott is the former director of the Northeast ADA Center. Andrea, what are some of the events and activities that you feel have most impacted the centers and the work that they do? Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I think that there are a number of ways that events and activities have really um, allowed people to see the centers as the resources that they are. And we talk about the annual um, anniversary of the ADA and the events that are happening in our communities across the, um, across the country. The ADA centers really provide that level of support and continuity and, and dissemination of information that allows for things like um, as mentioned before, the ADA Amendments Act. Um, I think we also see the ADA Symposium as a large national event and some of the other types of activities that have happened at local areas across the country. I think those types of large-scale training events have been um, just instrumental in highlighting the good work that the ADA centers do and the resources that they offer outside of whatever training event that we're talking about, but the, the resources and the follow-up and the additional information that may be needed, I think it is key. Um, and one of the things that actually just happened this week is um, I I work uh, for Cornell University as the ADA coordinator and our university landscape architect sent me a, um, a link and he's like, oh, there's this great training that's coming up. Um, I wondered if you knew about it. And it was part of uh, the accessibility online training that, um, that is happening 
um, for accessible pedestrian trails and shared use paths that's part of the center work. So it was like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of it. I'm actually signed up um, as well to be able to participate. And it's one of those things is that that knowledge, that, that level of connectivity, especially in the past year with COVID, I think um, to be able to continue to disseminate information in a clear, concise and effective way are those types of um, things that, that it provides a level of presence um, that the center offers to folks and I think has been really key um, to understanding how things are happening and, and um, how to let people know um, as well as to feel connected. Marion Vessels is the former director of the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. How did the inquiries and training requests following the Department of Justice updating its regulations covering state and local governments and businesses change for the centers? As well as, were there any new audiences that were drawn to the centers because of these changes? I think the centers all welcomed the revisions that uh, the Department of Justice did to the Title II and Title III regulations. It gave them a chance to reset include, look at new uh, developments such as segways as a type of mobility device for people, um, include things like correctional facilities that hadn't been given a lot of attention, um, looking at things like ticketing, focusing on the lodging industry, um, what is effective communication, and our ever favorite service animals. Leah Riley is a senior code consultant with Burnham Nationwide. Describe how the ADA National Network has assisted you in understanding and applying the accessibility requirements under the ADA. Well, I have been working in accessibility for over 20 years, and, and as long as I can remember, I've been able to utilize the technical guidance from the National Network. Um, I utilize it for um, technical assistance on ADA questions, um, and I have talked to people in different jurisdictions, different areas um, across the country, um, your different network, um, like the Great Lakes, and I've also called other areas when I've had work in those areas, and I've always gotten really good guidance in terms of um, understanding an issue and what the compliance requirements are. I also participate in the uh, webinars that are hosted and posted on the um, National Network's uh, websites. And all of those have been really informative and I've learned a lot and been able to ask questions and understand information that I wasn't always familiar with in the past. And I did also attend the National Symposium, which was great in terms of just getting access to so much information in such a short period of time um, with the different types of mm -hmm. seminars available and meeting different people and being able to network with um, all sorts of um, people from different, different aspects of accessibility. So I think the, the ability to have access to something like that that's hosted as part of the ADA National Network is, is great opportunities to learn and grow and uh, be able to continue what I'm doing and provide the, the most updated and as accurate as possible information. Emily Schumann is the director of the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. What unique aspects of the states you serve created the greatest challenging in terms of your outreach efforts? Also, what types of capacity building efforts did you engage in in your region? Thank you. That's a great question, Peter. Um, the Rocky Mountain region, or Region 8, is the second largest geographical region but has the smallest population. Uh, so as you can imagine, the biggest challenge that we faced is outreach to widespread rural communities. Um, often folks in our region just aren't looking online for ADA information or learning about the ADA Center in the usual ways. Um, so we spend a lot of time and effort making more personal connections with the individual community leaders and influencers. 
um, going to trade shows and conferences and meeting the folks in our region wherever um, they gather together. One of the most notable capacity building activities we've undertaken over the years is the implementation of a regional advisory committee. The committee consists of advi advisors in every state who are deeply entrenched in ADA implementation and who are considered community leaders. Uh, currently, we have 16 advisors representing all six states in our region. Not only does this help us reach cons constituents in otherwise out of the way areas, um, our reach and effectiveness in providing information, guidance, and training that is tailored to meet the needs of Region 8 stakeholders is increased exponentially. Julie Brinkoff is the director of the Great Plains ADA Center. What areas and topics has your center had the biggest impact within your region? And how have you been able to build capacity and conduct outreach in the rural areas of your region? Well, that's a very pertinent question for our region because so much of it is rural, you know, little, little towns and, and communities um, throughout the region. And I think <clears throat> one of the most important things we found was collaborating, um, especially in terms of outreach and information with groups already recognized in those communities. So I'm thinking of university extension and agribility projects, um, and also county associations. Those are really important because so many people in rural communities are actually more plugged into their county services than they are to city services. Um, so those are have been really important and critical for us to work with in terms of outreach and dissemination. But another group that we really worked with in terms of uh, building their capacity is services for independent living. Uh, those centers in our region tend to have satellite offices. They're well dispersed um, throughout the entire region and um, people with disabilities use their services. So we found that by building not only, you know, giving them information um, to disseminate, but actually building their capacity to do training and um, provide technical assistance and acting as a continual source of support for them has uh, really been effective um, in rural areas. In terms of our impact in rural areas, you know, I, I would like to think it's everything and that it's been really wonderful. But if I can <clears throat> look at two areas, I'm going to say with small businesses, so many small businesses um, just don't know what to do. They're in older buildings. They have questions. And um, there's a real sense of relief when they learn about readily achievable under the ADA and realizing that they may not have the funds to be um, completely compliant. They may have old buildings that are impossible to get completely compliant, but under the ADA, they can work toward compliance and we can help them um, under readily achievable identify what they can do and set priorities um, for becoming more accessible. And um, so I think we actually, I can say, I think we've done a good job for, with this and it's something that the small business community um, really wants and needs. On the flip side, in looking at um, local governments, it's program access. And again, so many local governments can't immediately become accessible, but realize that they still need to provide services um, to their disability community. And so we work with them to understand how program access fits into that overall self-evaluation and transition plan so they can still make sure that their constituents um, get those kinds of accessible services using program access. I think the other thing that's just really, really important in working with rural communities is realizing that their needs are different than larger areas. And the fiscal resources and the staffing resources they have may be much more limited. But that doesn't mean that the commitment and the desire to provide accessible services isn't there. David Robb is the ADA coordinator for the village of Arlington Heights. Describe how the ADA National Network has assisted you in performing the responsibilities as an ADA coordinator. So the, the national ADA National Network has been an invaluable resource to me. In my role uh, as ADA coordinator, it has specifically the information that I have found in their Title I, II, and III 
uh, technical assistance guides in the ADA handbook uh, has laid a solid foundation for me in understanding non-discrimination on the basis of disability, equal access and inclusion, and mainstream. Not only that, but the technical requirements for anything from curb ramps to pound, uh, door opening force and all those types of things. Um, the, I work with the Commission for Citizens with Disabilities and their role in the community is to address uh, issues on disability. The commission has hosted a number of ADA trainings supplied by our regional center over the years. Um, I also work with the ADA coordinators group through the Metropolitan's Mayor's Caucus. And through them, we have done a number of trainings that the network has supplied speakers for, including um, introduction to accessible technology, the ADA in, and international building codes, ADA transition plans and Title II responsibilities, and trends in ADA compliance and enforcement. Um, the, the other uh, really valuable resource is the guidance that I get through the ADA Center. On, um, they're always available to discuss situations that arise concerning ADA issues. They, can, they give me valuable information on uh, ADA requirements, how they apply or not. And uh, so the, all that has been just super fantastic as far as um, them being a, a resource to me in my role as ADA coordinator for the village. Anna Burke is the former director of the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. What do you feel have been the most significant contributions or areas of impact the ADA National Network has had on the disability community? Hi, Peter. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is this one's a little bit of a hard uh, hard question to answer and just narrow it down to a couple of things. Um, I, I want to look at it uh, kind of broadly and say that I, I think probably one of the greatest ways that this, the network has um, served people with disabilities across the country is as a self-advocacy tool. Um, in this case, it really is, you know, knowledge really is power and empowerment. And so since 1991, the centers have been a place, a safe place where individuals with disabilities could take their questions, have them answered, get the information they need anonymously if they needed to, um, but also one-on-one, -on -one, very case-specific, um, so that they could then go back to their lives, go back to their communities, their workplaces, and advocate for themselves. Um, whether that is, you know, notifying a business owner that there's a problem with their parking, their accessible parking, um, whether it's requesting and negotiating a reasonable accommodation in their workplace. Um, the, the ADA centers have really become a place where individuals with disabilities can go centrally um, and, and ask those questions and get that information um, for the most part free or at very low cost. Um, and then, of course, we've also, as a network, worked very hard since the beginning to help build that capacity that a lot of folks have talked about already um, within the local grassroots communities of people with disabilities. So that not only are we as a network providing that information and that advocacy power, um, but also building the capacity at the more local levels um, to be able to be that resource for people with disabilities as well. Liz Treston is a person with a disability and a disability advocate. Talk about how the ADA National Network has assisted you in learning about your rights as a person with a disability and how it has assisted you in your advocacy work in your community. I've heard, hi, thank you for having me, Peter, and the ADA National Network. I first discovered uh, what I call ZipTac at one of the abilities expos in New Jersey. And I'm not quite sure who I met. It was probably Joe. And he said, you know, whenever you have an issue regarding the ADA, you can give us a call. I live in Nassau County 
and I began to have a lot of issues. So I would call them regarding primarily things about uh, bis first businesses, if they had a ramp, what was the ratio? Because I found I could not, even with the ramp, I could not get in because it was not built to code. And I would, and they would give me the information and I would take it to the business owner. And once in a while, they actually would change it. Uh, I believe there's still a lot of work for everyone to do in regard to the ADA. I still see businesses, uh, new businesses opening and not following uh, the codes because either they don't know or it's not enforced at the local or even at the state level. I call, I like to call them Joe and Jennifer, and they always remind me that they are not lawyers and this is not legal advice, but the information that they provide to individual, individuals as well as to communities is, is a very important aspect of, of anyone learning about the ADA and what it means to an individual, to businesses, and to government entities. Pam Williamson is the former director of the Southeast ADA Center. Discuss how the collaboration and relationships with the federal agencies that enforce the ADA have uh, enhanced the effectiveness and the work done by the ADA National Network. Thank you, Peter. I'm so excited to be able to talk about this relationship. I remember when I joined the centers um, back in 1999, I went to one of the first directors meetings uh, and I had come from an organization where there was and was familiar with the ADA and, and the names of John Wodatch with the U.S. Department of Justice and other folks from EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and the Access Board. And then I walk into this room and John Wodatch is there. I felt like I had walked into a room with rock stars because these were people who, uh, you know, were there uh, helping to develop the law and, and writing regulations and developing uh, the enforcement. And so it was really exciting for me as, as, a, as a young professional to walk in there. But then what I got to see, and over the past 22 years, what I have uh, continued to see is the fact that, you know, this is a mutually beneficial relationship between the federal agencies who have enforcement authority over the ADA and the ADA National Network. One of the, one of the things that I think is so very important uh, to highlight here is the fact that we have worked together because as the ADA National Network, and especially as we reach people at the regional, state, and local levels, we really have the finger on the pulse of what's happening at the local level and know what and, and kind of what the hot button issues are. And we've been able to share that with our federal partners. And that has led to them developing publications or trainings or other materials that have been beneficial across the country. Dave Capozzi is the former executive director of the United States Access Board. Dave, talk about your relationship and experiences working with the ADA National Network. Well, uh, so I retired from the Access Board last year, about a year ago. Um, but before that, I uh, was working at the board uh, for over 28 years. So I started um, just about when the ADA centers began. And I can remember the first time, um, so I would meet regularly with the project directors at least once a year. Um, when they came to Washington. And I remember the first time we met, um, we set up a liaison relationship between the 10 regional centers. And at the time we had 10 accessibility specialists. So we had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with each of the centers. And that really worked out great because the Access Board um, is a small agency. And people would often ask, so how do you get so much done for such a small agency? 
And it was almost like we had regional offices with the ADA centers. Um, and that really was a big benefit to a small agency. And then um, later on uh, in 2011, we wanted to really get our um, word out more to people. So we reached out to the Great Lakes ADA Center and uh, contracted with them to do webinars. And the board has been doing webinars since 2011 on a monthly basis for built, built environment accessibility issues. And then since 2013 for technology issues around section 508 and all of those hundreds of them now have been archived and um, they're very successful. Um, the access board staff would always, we would send two or three people to the ADA symposiums as a way to get the information out. Um, so that was another way that uh, we had a, a really good relationship. And then um, the board had created over a dozen, I think it was 14, um, advisory committees over the years that I was at the board to, to bring together stakeholders to help the board develop new regulations. And at least three of those advisory committees, the ADA centers were members of the um, Public Rights of Way Advisory Committee, the ADAG Review Advisory Committee, and Passenger Vessels. So those are just some of the ways that um, the board and the ADA centers have cooperated over the years. And um, and it was it, it's a great relationship. It's always has been, and uh, hopefully it will continue to be so. Mel Toy is the director of the Northwest ADA Center. Why is the work done by the ADA National Network still needed? And how does the network stay relevant and effective going forward? Thank you, Peter. The work done by the ADA National Network is still necessary because the promise of the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA has yet to be fulfilled. Uh, it's the most comprehensive disability rights law in the country. It's been around for over 30 years. For many people, it's a household name. And yet uh, people with disabilities continue to experience exclusion and discrimination in areas of employment and community living. And their access needs are often an afterthought if they're thought of at all. So the work of the ADA National Network is needed in order to bring and keep the ADA in the forefront of people's minds uh, to um, actively circulate accurate and unbiased information about the ADA uh, to provide a safe and responsive place for anyone to ask their ADA questions um, and to train future ADA trainers, ambassadors, and champions of the ADA throughout the country. Happy 30th anniversary, ADA National Network. Happy, Happy anniversary. anniversary. Welcome. My name is Peter Berg. 30 Thank you. Sorry about that. We're uh, going to just switch over here for a second. We have some images we'd like to share with you that represent the um, 30 years of just different uh, things that highlight um, what happens with the network or what has happened with the network. I'm here. I'm having some trouble with my mouse. Whoops. So So we're going to look back here at the um, years with the ADA National Network from 1991 to 2001, which is a the 30 year anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
just starting with some of our images, just as the ADA symposium exhibits some individuals from 2006 who were attending and part of the exhibit hall and uh, providing information. So the long history of the ADA National Network and working with collaboratively on the ADA National Symposium. Here's a picture of Jim DeYoung, who is the former uh, director of the Great Plains ADA Center, sitting at a table at the um, uh, symposium with some of the other attendees from the symposium. Here's a picture of in from San Francisco from when uh, we had our directors meeting some of our former as well as current ADA Center staff. So we have Shelly Kaplan, Erica Jones, um, Peter Berg, and uh, Suzanne Breyer, and um, Bob, who was a, a former staff member. A more composite picture again of individuals from that same meeting, uh, from both past and present, Marion Vessels and uh, Mary, uh, Maria DeMaia and Pat Going and um, Bob Gaddis who were formerly from the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, Erica Jones from the um, Pacific ADA Center, Suzanne Breyer from the um, Northeast ADA Center, Peter Berg from the Great Lakes ADA Center, um, and Pam Williamson from the um, South East ADA Center, along with Shelly Kaplan from the Southeast ADA Center, and Bob from the Great Lakes ADA Center. This is an image of a uh, document that was done by Gallaudet University that many of us used and referred to called the ADA and U. It's a guide for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. Here's an image of a report that our um, region, Region 5, put out for the uh, sixth year of our existence as an ADA national network, just highlighting some of the programs and activities that we had been engaged in. This is a series of posters that um, demonstrate some of the different uh, advocacy themes uh, that the ADA centers have worked with. Um, one is a image of um, in somebody in a wheelchair with their hands um, uh, handcuffed behind them with the words rights worth fighting for. And the other is a, a, a poster from ADAPT, which says power concedes nothing without a demand. And it features the ADAPT um, fist with the um, ADAPT logo, which is a individual uh, stick figure in a wheelchair with um, shackles broken um, across their wrist. And it is a it features a quote by Frederick Douglass of it will never and it never did and it never will, um, which is a famous quote from him. This is from the 2013, 30 years of ADAPT activism. This is something that the ADA Center has used for a long period of time. This is our core curriculum, which was our basis for many of our trainings. It was presentation materials uh, for the network. Um, it was done in 1995. It was our second edition. And this was developed by the Adaptive Environments Organization in collaboration with the Great Plains ADA Center, as well as Cornell University Program on Employment um, and Disability, which was the precursor to the Northeast ADA Center. This is a technical assistance um, project report. We uh, purchased, published yearly reports, um, still do, in regards to the activities of the ADA National Network. This is from January of 2003. And this report was often um, distributed to legislators and others um, who were policymakers and such to really highlight the work of the ADA National Network um, as, and the things that we did. This is a photo of uh, President Barack Obama as he was meeting the theorist uh, uh, physicist Stephen Hawking. Um, Stephen Hawking, as many know, had ALS and used a customized power wheelchair and augmentative communication to live and work as independently as possible. This is a um, image of a um, proceedings from a conference for the ADA Center's first research um, conference, State of the Science Conference in 2010. It was held in Ex Alexandria, Virginia. The ADA centers created some um, PSAs in Spanish that we distributed widely to public television and other television and uh, media stations in order to teach and learn more about the ADA uh, National Network. And this was done in 1999. This is a uh, image of a videotape that was called Getting It Right, it's Etiquette Tips. It was uh, produced by Meeting the Challenge, which is the uh, was the host agency for the uh, Rocky Mountain ADA Center has since uh, transpired to a different agency, but that is the foundation Meeting the Challenge. 
Again, another document um, or training course that was produced by the um, Rocky Mountain ADA Center along with the University, um, uh, Utah State University. It's a four part training course um, covering employment, facility accessibility, transportation, program access, and effective communication. This is an image of an uh, advocacy um, cartoon that was used and has been talked about as one of the very frequent things that the ADA Center has dealt with, and that is the issue of snow removal. And this is a particular um, cartoon that reads that um, it was a series of kid children on one side and a person with a disability um, in a wheelchair on the other side and somebody shoveling. And um, the person says, um, could you please shovel the ramp? And the individual shoveling says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them, I will clear up that ramp for you. And then the individual says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. Um, so this is a you know issue that the ADA centers have dealt with for a long time is the issue of universal access and how we um, can create uh, better access for everyone. This is another um, uh, uh, resource from the ADA National Network, No Barriers no, um, for Business. Again, it was a uh, document that was done collaboratively through Cornell and Department of Education, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, head, headed up by Suzanne Breyer from Cornell. Um, and it was a human resource guide uh, looking at a number of different issues around um, employment and um, Americans with Disabilities Act. And it was a tape. Um, uh, that had uh, brochures um, and highlighted brochures uh, on a variety of different issues. This is another resource that was created by the ADA National Network at this time. We were called the ADA and IT Technical Assistance Centers. We had a brief period of time where our name was changed. And this was a, a specific resource on K through 12 and beyond as it would relate to um, uh, barriers for individuals. And it was produced by Meeting the Challenge and it was both in a um, uh, written format, a CD, ROM, as well as a tape. This is just a disability awareness for law enforcement curriculum that was produced in a grant from um, uh, the uh, Department of Education and such, um, and it looked at abuse and, and neglect and it was done at the University of Illinois at Chicago in collaboration with the Great Lakes ADA Center and the Department on Disability and Human Development. This is a poster of the National Symposium in Chicago that was held in 2007. It's an image of the skyline of Chicago. This conference was held at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare. Next image is of an image of ADA Jeopardy style. This was a Jeopardy um, game that was produced by the ADA National Network. Um, and it was uh, um, developed um, so that individuals could um, basically play a Jeopardy game uh, as part of their training and things of that nature. Um, and we recently hosted a uh, ADA Jeopardy um, for the 30th anniversary that if you would have um, missed, you may have missed, but you can always see it was recorded and is available. Um, on the uh, website at www.ada-audio.org under the archives, which was a celebration of the um, anniversary of the ADA and the ADA National Network, which was a Jeopardy game, a live Jeopardy game. This is an image of individuals who were attending um, as part of the um, celebration of the ADA anniversary and a variety of different images that were produced by Tom Olin, um, who's a very well-known disability um, pho photo um, journalist and the uh, responding to questions and things of that nature. And there's just some additional uh, photos um, taken by Tom of the various different um, activities that marked the um, up to the passage of the ADA and beyond with many of the advocacy efforts around transportation and marches and such in Washington, DC, leading up to the actual um, passage of the ADA. The next image is of a toolkit that was developed when we were uh, part of the information technology assistance project that we were um, uh, engaged in. And this is a toolkit for us on assistive technology from 2002. Another uh, resource that is used by, by the ADA National Network um, was called Speak Out about info, inaccessible information and tech, uh, telecommunication technology. It was done in 2004. 
This is an image of a um, exhibit where we were promoting the ADA National Network. Um, and this is called the Wheel of Justice. And you can see an individual who was a um, consumer person with a disability who was uh, engaged in the game. And the game um, had a variety of different categories associated with it that individuals uh, could win a prize if they were able to answer the question. So they would spin the wheel and answer a question about the ADA um, wherever it landed. Some of you may remember the um, fifth anniversary of the ADA when we had the torch relay sponsored by the um, American Association of Persons with Disabilities and Volkswagen particularly were the main sponsors. Um, it traveled around the country and uh, it did have a, a stop in Chicago. It had a stop in many country, many places across the country. Um, again, for the 10th anniversary of the ADA and this uh, torch was carried from city to city um, across the country, similar to what you think of as the torch traveling for the Olympics. Um, it was very similar. So this torch was then um, traveled across the country um, and hit major uh, metropolitan areas and celebrated the anniversary of the ADA, which was really the first big landmark um, anniversary for the ADA, the 10th year. These just represent, this image represents just some of the tools that are used by the ADA National Network when we're engaged in accessibility reviews and surveys and such. And we recommend to architects and others that are doing this kind of work. So different kinds of um, levels, a, um, accessibility sticks, um, version one and two that were produced and um, often used uh, with uh, predetermined uh, uh, distances or uh, measurements on it uh, to help people who are doing surveys and such. And then this is a next image is of uh, measuring devices used for the door force um, that we would use to measure how much weight uh, it took for a door to open or close. So there's two of them. One has a hook on the other end for measuring um, opening force and the other um, has a uh, plunger for um, uh, measuring closing. One of the foundational documents for the ADA National Network was the Americans with Disabilities um, Handbook, which was the very first publication that came out um, after the shortly after the passage of the ADA. And you heard some of the directors talk about the fact that we didn't have a lot of materials early on, but this was kind of the Bible that was available for many years, um, uh, published by the EEOC and the Department of Justice um, until additional documents um, could be created. And again, this was only available in hard copy. So this is something you had to mail out. Um, it weighed about five pounds. Um, and it was something that was used in a lot of training and a lot of technical assistance activities and efforts early on. Still is a good resource for foundational information about the ADA. This is a picture of Will Morales, who is with the uh, um, Southeast ADA Center, just celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act um, at one of the anniversary dates. This is a um, article from a um, newspaper uh, featuring Fulton County Office for Disability Affairs for the ninth anniversary of the ADA. Um, and there were different individuals, uh, Tony Boatwright, Nancy Duncan, and Will Morales in the uh, photo. So this made some uh, news. Uh, it was nice to see how the uh, press would cover the ADA anniversaries and such. This is a, a training that was held, um, ADA Trainer Network, which is still in existence today. And this is across many of the regions, uh, coordinated by Cornell University and the Northeast ADA Center. Um, but many uh, of the centers across the country have been trained um, as part of the ADA Net Trainer Network and have um, since offered the training network um, in their various regions as well. We highlighted the training network in a um, webinar se session that was held um, earlier this year. Um, so if you're interested, again, you can go back to the archives at www.ada-audio.org and look for the 38th anniversary spotlight on um, various training programs offered by the ADA National Network. This is an accessibility manual that was created for a Bodies of Work Cultural Arts um, Festival for Disability in 2006. It was developed by the Great Lakes ADA Center in collaboration um, with uh, um, the Illinois Arts Council and um, uh, Nidler, N-I-D-R-R. This is just an image of a fan that was produced for the um, uh, 2010 ADA anniversary. Um, so that was the 10 year anniversary of the ADA and uh, ADA centers had a history of creating these fans because of course in July every year, one of the hottest times of the year for everybody to be doing their celebrations and such. So this is one of the first ones we offered back in 2010. 
Next image is a poster that is a collaboration of um, all of the posters, various posters that were created for the 25th anniversary of the ADA um, put into one. And this is available as a, um, a poster to purchase. This next image is of the uh, low slogan for the 25th ADA anniversary, which was Disability Rights Are Civil Rights, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act 1990 to 2015. Um, this image is a, um, a back, black background with a rainbow um, gradation of colors with the words Disability Rights Are Civil Rights, ADA 25, Americans with Disabilities Act 1990 to 2015. During the 25th anniversary of the ADA, um, the ADA National Network sought for uh, individuals to pledge um, support for the ADA um, uh, in their countries, in their, in their communities, in their counties, et cetera. Um, and we had a pledge process where you would sign up online um, and pledge your support. And this was a image of one of the postcards that was used to be able to uh, promote that. And it says expand opportunities and pledge on, commit to another 25 years and beyond adaanniversary.org, celebrating 25 years, 1990 to 2015, Americans with Disabilities Act, www.adata.org. This was sponsored by the ADA National Network. This is just an image of one of the events um, uh, in the marches leading up for the ADA um, anniversary, 25th anniversary. You can see the number of people, the sweatshirts and the enthusiasm and such um, that are brought in the face of the mixed crowd um, of individuals that are um, marching in support of the anniversary. Again, uh, an image of a young girl, um, young white female, uh, holding up a balloon and a flag that says ADA 25, also wearing a yellow t-shirt that says ADA 25, Americans with Disability Act, and this is from uh, Celebrate ADA Boston in 2000 um, for the 25th anniversary. This is a, um, again, from Boston, from the celebration that they had, and it was a, it features a banner that reads Youth for the Americans with Disabilities Act with the logo for the 20, ADA 25th anniversary, um, followed by a number of young people who are carrying um, the banner as well as marching with their uh, t-shirts that are yellow with the ADA 25 logo on them. Is another one of the fans that was handed out as part of the 25th anniversary of the ADA. Um, and this was sponsored by the Great Lakes ADA Center. The next image is of the ADA 25 years Boston Commons. Again, you saw the pictures from, from the uh, marches and such from July of 2015, which was the 25th anniversary of the ADA. It's an image in uh, red, white, and blue uh, with the ADA 25 years, Boston Common, July 22nd, 2015, celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act and the backdrop of the skyline of the city of Boston and a website, www.ada25boston.org. The next image is of the Road to Freedom bus um, with a number of individuals from the um, uh, North, I'm sorry, from the um, New England ADA Center who were gathered um, with uh, Tom Olin, who was the person who drove the bus. And this is when um, the bus came to um, uh, Boston and was on exhibit. There's a, a banner, uh, next image is as an actual display uh, shows the bus, ADA 25, Display Rights Are Civil Rights. And this is a banner that the ADA National Network produced and traveled to many uh, locations across the country because the bus itself could not get there, um, but this very large display could get there. And so it was used in support of um, many activities like abilities expos and such across the country in celebration of the ADA 25th anniversary. Just another image of that same banner with a white female in a wheelchair next to it with a smile on her face um, as she was uh, using this as a photo opportunity um, for celebrating the 25th anniversary of the ADA. Again, a banner with a picture of the Road to Freedom bus, um, which was used as part of the ADA 25 celebration. And again, the banners display rights are civil rights. The next is again a picture of the um, actual bus itself uh, parked in front of the Capitol. 
um, uh, state capital and uh, just uh, showing that, um, you know, it went all over the country and it was in uh, very prominent places to get attention um, from uh, legislators and, and individuals uh, in policymaking positions. Another image of the Road to Freedom bus with the Southeast ADA Center staff when it visited them in Georgia. Um, and again, as I said, uh, this bus traveled across the country from the east to the west, north to the south um, for uh, almost a year. This is a display a float that was used in a parade as part of the ADA anniversary. Um, it is displaying the ADA anniversary, 25th anniversary logo. Um, on one side, a picture of the signing of the ADA with President Bush and the various dignitaries on the other side being pulled by a red pickup truck. This is a image of an individual from uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, who is uh, celebrating the ADA anniversary for the 25th anniversary with a very large banner that shows the ban the logo for the 88th 25th anniversary, uh, the map of um, Michigan, and the words Kalamazoo and Michigan across it. And here the individual is a white female, white male who is wearing a um, ADA 25 uh, t-shirt. The next image is a banner. Um, for the ADA 25th anniversary, Disability Rights Are Civil Rights, um, and it has got Peter Berg and Robin Jones from the Great Lakes ADA Center standing next to it. The next image is a image of the skyline of the downtown Chicago, um, whereby some of the businesses got into the spirit of the ADA 25 um, as part of our celebrations here, and they lit up their building with the words ADA 25 in lights that would shine at night. And this was done through the entire month of July. The next is the um, uh, poster that was produced by the ADA National Network for the 25th anniversary. It shows the ADA um, anniversary, 25th anniversary logo, followed by an image of the Road to Freedom bus with the logo Disability Rights Are Civil Rights and content tech information for the ADA National Network, 800-949-4232 or website www.adata.org. The next is an image of um, Robin Jones, Great Lakes ADA Center Director, speaking at the State Capitol in Michigan for the ADA 25th anniversary. White female, short hair, um, and wearing one of the t-shirts for the ADA 25th anniversary. The next image is of a quiz book, ADA quiz book that was produced by the um, Rocky Mountain ADA Center. This is the third edition. There are multiple editions as the ADA amended, changed, and, and were updated over time. Available for purchase from the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. The next is the logo of the 26th anniversary of the ADA, um, showing the um, uh, disability rights are civil rights with the years 1990 to 2016, and a very large 26. The next is a image of the 27th anniversary of the ADA um, logo, which has got the ADA and then 27 in very large um, letters and the Celebrate the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a red, white, and blue logo. The next image is from the um, Village of Arlington Heights, Commission on Citizens with Disabilities. You heard Dave Robb speak in the video, who was a ADA coordinator for the Village of Arlington Heights, talk about his commission for citizens with disabilities. This is an image of them um, at the uh, parade um, in their village and the float behind them. It has an image that shows the signing of the ADA with President Bush and dignitaries uh, behind it. The next is an image of some staff members from the um, New England ADA Center, I'm sorry, the Southeast ADA Center, who are um, testing out an accessible picnic bench um, and looking at um, the features of that accessible picnic bench. The next is a banner um, showing the um, logo, nothing about us without us, which has been a mantra for the ADA uh, and for disability rights and advocacy for many years. And this is a poster showing many images of disability in the backdrop um, with a, a uh, banner showing the words um, 
nothing about us without us um, the, uh, on the, as an overlay. The next image is that of the ADA anniversary, 28th um, anniversary uh, from uh, ADA um, Americans with Disabilities Act from 1990 to the year 2018. Next image is a picture of a, a group of uh, uh, individuals, African-American individuals at a conference um, event celebrating the um, Disability Pride Month. And this was held in um, downtown Chicago. And they are all um, saying, using sign language, I love you, um, and uh, it, sitting in front of their booth. The next is a picture of Barry Whaley from the Southeast ADA Center standing in front of a series of photographs at Moorhead College, historically black university. And the most prominent image there is of Martin Luther King um, Jr. with his uh, graduation outfit. And also as an image of uh, President Barack Obama um, as well uh, in that, uh, the commencement. The next is another fan that was produced by the ADA National Network. And this is for um, just a, a giveaway uh, with, it says, has the logo of the ADA National Network, information, guidance, and training on the Americans with Disabilities Act. With questions about the ADA, giving the phone number 800-949-4232, voice and TTY, as well as the website www.adata.org. We now have the 29th anniversary of the ADA logo, um, which pr uh, presents a red, white, and blue ADA 29 with the years 1990 to 2019. Celebrate the ADA July 26, 2019. Next is a image of a um, group of individuals who are marching as, as part of a parade in celebration of the ADA anniversary and disability pride. So the group of individuals from a variety of different um, t-shirts and um, marking the anniversary as well as um, individuals with a variety of different um, disabilities, ethnic groups, et cetera, represented here. Next is an image of a individual who is using um, CART uh, during a training session, um, CART being real-time captioning and that is being offered and being viewed on a uh, computer um, during a training session. The next image is of individuals who are participating in some training exercises during some training held for the ADA um, National Network, ADA Trainer Network um, activities. And they're just um, uh, gathering around some different activities that were um, part of the training network process. The next image is of individuals who are part of the um, Bulls um, wheelchair basketball team in the uh, city of Chicago who are doing a demonstration on the plaza as part of the recognition of the ADA anniversary. And the next image is that same group of individuals, young, um, young men who are all part of the uh, Chicago Bulls um, wheelchair basketball team um, and uh, who were doing an, a demonstration for the ADA anniversary. The next image is of the ADA anniversary logo for 30 years. Um, again, red, white, and blue uh, showing the ADA 30 and Americans with Disabilities Act. For that year, we have some fans again, as well as a mask, because it marked the year of COVID, when there weren't a lot of activities or anything around the anniversary, but we still distributed information um, uh, to individuals that they could use and promote um, in their uh, homes and in their workplaces. And the next image is of um, uh, Jim DeYoung, who is from the uh, former director of the Great Plains ADA Center, as well as Sally Conway, former employee of the um, US Department of Justice during a presentation at the ADA Symposium. The next image is from the ADA 31st anniversary, which we are celebrating this year, 1990 to 2021. Again, red, white, and blue with the words um, ADA 31 and Americans with Disabilities Act. The next image is a poster that was created for uh, recognition of the 31st anniversary of the ADA. Uh, red, white, and blue again, 31 years, Americans with Disabilities Act with a slogan, is enough notice. 
Um, this poster was sponsored by the Disability Empower Network, as well as the Great Lakes ADA Center. So again, happy anniversary to the ADA National Network, and thank you very much for joining us today. We just have a few minutes yet for some questions that anybody might have. If anybody has any questions that you would like to ask of anybody of the ADA National Network, this would be your time to do it. We have many of the directors who have joined us today um, for the live presentation. So I would open it up at this time to anyone who would like to ask a question. You can submit your question in the Q&A area. Peter, do we have any questions? We just got one question in. And that was just a comment. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, directors, Robin, that uh, joined us that were not part of the, the video and just want to acknowledge uh, Anne uh, Deschamps, of, uh, director of uh, the uh, Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. And we have Barry Wally from the uh, Southeast ADA Center that have uh, joined us. And we've got just a few minutes here. Uh, can ask a quick question, Anne, if uh, you're willing to uh, turn on your, mute, your, your microphone and answer a question. Uh, and we've heard uh, the 800 number, 1-800-949-4ADA. Uh, 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 the youngsters uh, know, knew that that standard stood for that. Uh, but and all the, all the uh, 10 regional centers have their own websites. But talk about the benefit of the, the national network website, adata.org. And more importantly, the content, all the fact sheets that have been developed by the national network and distributed by all of the different centers. Well, the benefit of, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter and, and Robin. Um, this has been great. Um, the benefit of the of ADATA.org is that it brings together all the materi materials of the whole national network so that um, it's all in one place because our center websites are geared toward our specific region and have region specific resources, as so many directors have talked about, but ADATA is the comprehensive site where you can go and see all the information about the different research projects the centers are doing. You can get any of the, um, the, the federal, link to any of the, the, the federal websites as well and get um, any of the documents that we've developed over the years. And there are many, many documents by subjects very well organized. and we all contribute to it as well. And um, many of the documents that are up there um, go through a vetting process where they're approved by all 10 centers before they're, they're posted. And it's been determined that it's gonna be of national benefit to all of us. So it is a fabulous, fabulous resource as, and as are the specific center specific websites too for regional information. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ann. And we are at the, the bottom of the hour. And as we go out here, uh, just uh, very pleased to have had the former and, and present day uh, directors uh, with us over the past 90 minutes uh, live and, and recorded. Uh, but also want to mention that uh, the directors and former directors uh, lead uh, staffs of, of committed individuals and, and as a whole, the ADA National Network um, are, are uh, individuals who are fully committed to the full inclusion of all persons with disabilities uh, in society and uh, doing so by providing information, uh, training and materials on the Americans with Disabilities Act. So happy anniversary, ADA National Network and uh, looking forward to another 30 years. Thanks everyone and thanks everyone to your commitment to full equality. And to contact your regional ADA center, you can do so at www.adata.org or by phone at 800-949-4232, both voice and TTY. Thank you and this concludes our session. You may now disconnect by closing your browser and or using the leave option in the lower right hand corner. Thank you.